guys listen to the Minor Details podcast? It's like half. That's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. So if you don't, James is one of the co-hosts and also a freelance industrial designer out of Brooklyn. Yeah. Uh, he's done work for Peloton, Bark, and Arleden as well. So, yeah. Uh, he's, James is going to talk a little bit about his experimentation process with us and share a sketch demo as well. So give him a big hand again. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> thank you for having me and thank you for being here. I know it's probably a very busy time and so hopefully I'll keep this interesting. Um, so I did want to do this presentation because I was asked to come out here and talk about exp experimentation and design. And this is the first time that I'm actually kind of giving a backstory to this experiment that I've been working on within my process. And so um, it's going to be a little bit like a Quentin Tarantino movie where things don't seem to connect until the very end. Um, so bear with me, but hello and thanks, Calvin. Um, like Calvin said, I'm a freelance industrial designer in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I first came to New York and worked at a company called Quirky, which is now dead. Well, no, it's actually re uh, revived but under new ownership. And it was sort of a social media um, type place where people were submitting ideas for us to develop. Um, but then after that internship, I went on to Lifetime Brands where I designed for these brands. Uh, I did a lot of design work. This is, this is some of the stuff that came out. So this is the first year uh, out of school designing professionally. Um, so it was a really great experience. I mean, I got to take things from what the boss said, soup to nuts. So. I took everything from sketching all the way to final CAD. So everything you see here is, is the CAD work that I did sent to China. Um, and so that, that was uh, a very enlightening process. Um, I also got to uh, build this brand, Rio, which you might not know of, but it's a smaller brand that Lifetime Brands incubated. Um, from there, after about three years, I left to start my freelancing career, and uh, Calvin was saying some of the companies that I've worked for, um, a lot of tech startups. Um, and so uh, this is some of the work to come out of that, and this, is, this kind of stuff like hasn't really been seen too much. I haven't posted about it yet, but this is a set of weights that I designed for Peloton um, in my first year there. Uh, and I've been sort of freelancing with them consistently because the head of industrial design there is actually my former manager from Lifetime Brands. So he and I have that kind of relationship. Uh, the inspiration for this was actually an upholstered cushion because Peloton is a fitness company that belongs in your home, fits in your home, um, and is not trying to stigmatize people that are just starting out with fitness to get into fitness. Um, and then I've also designed dog toys. Uh, so this is this interlocking tiki toy that I did for Bark. Uh, I love this dog. It's kind of like, what, what do you want me to do next? <laughs> um, so anyway, let's take a step back. Where did that, this all begin? And it all began right outside of Philadelphia. This was me at age seven. I was already drawing. Uh, I don't know if this is a product or, you know, just a future drone, but it's funny that I don't know that anybody taught me this, but I was already doing call outs on my sketches. Um, I, <laughs> and you can see the uh, water spurt, you know, fun little spelling mistakes. Um, fast forward, going to high school, I felt like I knew how to draw and I walked into freshman year art class and we learned continuous line sketching. Now, if you follow me on Instagram, you know this is a big deal for me. Um, but it was one of the hardest lessons that I ever had to learn. We came into freshman year class, and I was doing an art major in high school. And the teacher pointed at this tricycle hanging from the ceiling and said, draw that with one continuous line. And my feeling was, I know how to draw, thanks, you know. But really, I didn't. I was really arrogant in that way of just you know, staunchly kind of thinking, I knew what was right and I knew how to draw. And so 
I disregarded it for a while and I just was frustrated by it, um, it would only be later in the year that I would get a grasp on it, but I don't know that I ever truly understood it until later. Um, and uh, at the same time, every summer I was spending in Ocean City, New Jersey, and I was working on the boardwalk uh, right about there. And um, I was selling yo-yos and also these toys called Astro Jacks. I don't know if anybody knows of this toy, but this toy is the reason I became an industrial designer. And so I want to uh, cut to Swiss kids going nuts. This is actually a toy that came out of Switzerland. And the thing that I loved about it was how it was this and the yo-yo. It's this fluid, active creativity. And it just got me really excited. I, I loved this um, creating on the go, coming up with these moves. You know, it's something akin to skateboarding. And if you've ever been a yo-yoer, um, it's like that. I just thought that this was the closest that I would ever get to being a jazz musician, as if I could, if I could be as cool as these guys. <laughs> um, and so, I the other thing that I really loved about it was the product. I mean, I loved the packaging, the product itself. They went through all these iterations where they were doing interchangeable things, and you know, the colors and and everything was just so beautiful to me and I just kept asking myself who makes these and how could I be that person and my dad who's an engineer he took off his glasses and he said that's industrial design and so I looked at schools and I ended up at Virginia Tech sorry ASU um, I uh, and I went into the industrial design program there and I think for those of us who have gone to design school, we can all attest to that feeling of walking into the studio for the first time and you're like, oh my gosh, there's a place that exists like this where you can create a total mess and out of that create beautiful work. It was really amazing to me. And there, you know, you learn sort of that traditional industrial design sketching, or at least I did. This is not my sketch, by the way, but I thought it sort of exemplified what that traditional look is. And of course, you know, industrial design sketching is not a monolith. I mean, there's a lot of strong voices out there now, and especially because of Instagram, but this is what was there for me when I was in school. And, but while I was in school, I met this man who came and taught our studio, and his name is Joe Ballet. He was a professor at um, Carnegie Mellon and also the founder, co one of the co-founders of Maya Studio, uh, Studios out in Pittsburgh. And he had developed these form families. Now, if you follow me on Instagram or you know Reed Schlegel on Instagram, we did, an, we did a whole project around these. And the idea of this form family um, was to be able to take an, a product and push it through these different families to find unique forms and forms that you might not come up with if you were just trying to picture in your mind what a cool stapler would look like. It would really create a, an opportunity for very divergent thinking. And I just thought that this was so exciting that there were, that you could uh, use this kind of process um, and generate something unexpected. And you know, the other thing about it was, was sort of being able to have a common language and classifications of forms to be able to talk to, about them as industrial designers and, and share this language with each other. And so I got very into these families and, and really explored them during my thesis. So as you can see, I'm working through these, these different families. So from the tecto up at the top over here, down towards more of these plastiforms to create this rocking seat that I don't think I would have come up with had I just tried to picture it in my mind. It was a conversation between me and the paper uh, and with these form families. And so this was my senior thesis. It was this mobile standing desk 
Um, for elementary school kids, you would lift up on the neck. It would engage this ball in the bottom that you could roll around. You could also detach the top from the bottom, sit on the ball, and work at the desk. So anyway, that's just how I started to use these, this type of framework to generate these, these uh, unique forms. After school, I went on a study abroad. I was actually able to sneak in a study abroad uh, after I graduated with Virginia Tech to go to Spain and France. And uh, there's, there's some other moments in here that were pivotal for me to you know, sort of bring things together, such as going to the Guggenheim in Bilbao and seeing um, Thomas Heatherwick there was an exhibition of his iPad paintings. So this is a painting that was done on an iPad. And I was astounded by this because, you know, iPads had just come out when I was in college. Um, I had just gotten an iPhone. And I just, you know, this just made me think, like, what, what could I do with my, with my tab with, tablet, with my phone? You know, the idea that you have an infinite palette at your fingertips rather than the paints that you have with you. You just, you have everything at your fingertips. What can you do with it? Um, but then also continuous line came back into my life. We were at this harbor in La Rochelle in France and we were doing continuous line drawings. No, there wasn't a DeLorean in the water. This is just the best continuous line drawing uh, I could find. And um, so, you know, the thing that I was relearning about continuous line as our instructor led us through exercises of drawing these boats over and over was that continuous line is about observation. You know, a lot of times when you ask somebody to draw something in front of them, what they do is they end up spending more time looking at their paper than they do at the object. And so the, there's a lack of true understanding of what that object really is and there's a lack of observation, and continuous line forces somebody to really observe the object. And my feeling was is that as I thought about it, this, this sort of idea of observation, you know, it, it's significant to design in, in these sort of ways in which we observe things. We observe things constantly. We observe what we think is beautiful, what we think is ugly, what proportions we feel are right when we're looking at an object. But we also observe people. We, we you know, develop this keen observation of people in order to develop products that are going to benefit them in their life. We want to observe how they interact with things. Where are the pain points? What are the things that make them happy and excited? But the other thing is, is that when we're sketching, I feel that we are observing our mind. Things don't always come together, all together in your mind. And the way that I like to think about it is when you're sketching something, it's like you're trying to see something through a foggy window. And as you're sketching, you're kind of clearing away the fog. It, you kind of see details you know, sporadically and you move around to those things, but it's not always all there all together. And then I moved to New York um, and of course started working at Quirky, but at the same time I started Instagram. This is the Instagram logo that I knew to begin with. And um, I started experimenting with combining continuous line sketching and product design sketching. And so all of these sketches are continuous line, and, I, and it's also very clear that I did not know how to use filters because they're, it's, it's hideous. But, um, but yeah, I was just, I was in my room every night after work just drawing and seeing how continuous line could, could get me over certain hurdles and unlock certain forms because sometimes it can be very daunting if you haven't drawn something before to jump into it, and especially in the traditional way of design sketching where you're, you're sketching line by line, and one false line or one bad line feels like the, can feel like the end of the world when, when you're just starting out. And so this is treating it a lot less preciously and getting a lot more fluid. 
And I also started using Sketchbook Pro um, at my work. So I was learning digital sketching at the same time. Um, and the thing was is that there were these moments at New York, in New York where I felt like I could, what if I could do all of this? So one of those is in the crowded subways. Um, a lot of times, you know, I'll be sitting on the subway in between two, crunched between two strangers and there's not really an opportunity to do the type of sketching that you might want to do given your training. And then there's the coffee shop situation where you can't bring this workstation with you. Um, you know, and you can't really do this style of sketching because if you did and you were drawing through your lines, you would, you would slap that person next to you and they would leave the coffee shop and uh, never talk to you again. Uh, that's not a personal experience. But um, what I realized was I had these two things on me all the time. I had a notebook. I had a phone. Like, you know, I had the analog and the digital. And with the phone, it's like, what can I do with this? This is this amazing piece of technology that's in my pocket all the time. And I feel like I'm, I'm using it for unproductive things. How could I use it for productive things? And so one of the things that started to unlock it for me was Phil Padilla. Uh, and he was taking his iPad and taking pictures of his sketchbook pages and filling those pages in. And I was, I was amazed at this. I, I had never considered this before. Um, and, you know, this seemed really magical to me. I think. I think maybe I had taken sketches, analog sketches, and scanned them in and maybe refined them in digital, but the idea of just taking that sketch directly into digital to use that infinite palette was really intriguing to me. And so I ended up buying an iPad, and I started experimenting with this myself, but the problem I still had was that it was too bulky for my liking. And I really love the feeling of pen and paper. Um, and so what I ended up doing was combining all of these things. So, you know, from the Heatherwick iPad, you know, to uh, Phil's sketching, to the continuous line, because I love this idea of this fluid creativity and taking those two things that I always had on me and so to give you a sample of the type of thing I'm doing today, it looks like this. So I'm using continuous line first to fill the page in with my concepts. And I'm moving fluidly throughout the page and moving from detail to detail. And then I'm taking a photograph of that page and I'm bringing it into Sketchbook Pro on my phone and filling that page in. And so that, that is the, the long road that led me to this. All these things that didn't really make sense or didn't necessarily fit together at the time uh, but eventually, they all found their way into this style that I've been using. And, you know, if you can see, let's see, where's a good example? This, this sketch was done on the subway. That's subway floor right here, right there. So I sketched this on the subway. I put it down in the middle of the subway uh, and took a picture of it and rendered it. And this was all on my commute home from work. And so I'm able to use these times where it's not convenient to have your full workstation. And using the things on me, I can express myself, express these ideas, move through these ideas, develop them, uh, and then come home. And eventually, that sketch turns into this. 
And this is another experiment. You know, these are these are toys that are coming out of my out of my head because nobody's paid me to make them yet. Um, but these are these are the experiments. Um, and so now what I want to do is do a demo. And uh, if you want to do it with me, uh, you can download Sketchbook Pro on your phone if you don't already. Um, and then towards the end of the demo, I'm going to show you something that is a new um, is a new experiment I'm working on. Henry, I think I might need you to. You've got some Snapchats, you've got some Instagrams. Yeah. OK, perfect. Also, while I'm doing this demo, feel free to shout out questions at this, at this point. Um, I'm not going to hold you captive to just listening to me. If you have a question, let me know. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be sketching out some flashlights. And so I'm using this continuous line method and I'm moving around the page to the different details of this product. So I'm thinking about, okay, it needs a handle. Maybe this is where the grip ends. It's got a trigger back here for the flashlight. Maybe there's some sort of rubber around this. You got your LEDs in here. And so that's the way that I would move through one of these sketches. And then if I were to do it in perspective, I would just jump into perspective. The thing that I like about continuous line is, is that observational aspect. And especially when you're learning perspective for the first time, you know, it can be a kind of a daunting task, but if you're first observing objects in perspective and trying to replicate that, then you can start to gain an understanding of how an object sits in perspective. And the other thing that's really great about continuous line sketching is that as you're doing it, you are you know, when you're designing a product, you're oftentimes trying to find relationships between details of your object. And what continuous line can do is it can actually physically draw those relationships between those things. So you can sort of start to find those hidden relationships within an object. So I have to admit, I practiced a little bit before I came into this. <laughs> but I can show you that practice because that practice was, it was purely fluid, just trying to explore these different ideas. Um, and so in this way, this is all raw. This is not me thinking about what I'm doing. This is just ex exploring these forms. and finding things that I, that I like, details that I like, and pulling them into the next concept. But let me see. I'll, uh, I'll, try, to do, I'll try to do an original really quick. And, and that's the other thing is like, you know, continuous line, you can get very loose with it and then start filling in these details. Maybe it has some sort of... So, you know, and, and the thing is, is that I think the other thing that a lot of industrial design students get scared of is making that wrong line. And with one line, you're not, you're not really concerned that every line matters, you know, or that every line has to mean something. And so that's where taking it in to Sketchbook Pro to fill it in 
that's what's then defining the form. You're not, you're not necessarily fully defining it here. It's the relationship between those two things. And, you know, so with this one just right here, I sort of just sketched a gesture and then found this sort of, maybe it's a silicone clipping flashlight that can clip around something. Maybe, you know, and that can, that inspires a function. Do you want to, do you want to turn off your notifications? <laughs> Right. No worries. Um, so the question was, at what level of fidelity do I show the client? Or, yeah, I mean, typically this, um, I have not experimented with showing the client this yet. I think that that is a process of, of feeling out the client for what they, what they will accept. Like if they've worked with designers before, um, there's these guys' creative sessions on Instagram that are a great account to follow, and one of the things that they were showing was sketching on um, just post-it notes, taking pictures, bringing that into Photoshop, and, and rendering those out, and they were sending that to clients. So I think, you know, it, it might be a trial and error of, it does this communicate enough? Um, I was actually on my way here, I was sitting next to somebody who was studying for her MBA and I was sketching out these flashlights and she was like, that flashlight's so cool. Like she, she got it. So that was very encouraging to me. So I, cause I haven't really tested it out yet on a client. I, but uh, you know, I would probably take this a step further. And, but the other thing is, is that this style also lends itself to being a nice underlay for a sketch. So I can work, work all of these out and then just use these as underlays. Something that I, something that I sometimes like to do is actually use the back of a, of, a, of a paper, notebook paper, to then have that be my underlay for, and so, you know, then I'm cleaning up my line work, making the idea a little bit more palatable. So yeah, you can do that as well. Um, but let's uh, let's see which which page would you rather me render out this one or this one? One, okay. So now I'm just going to make sure my notifications are off. <laughs> <laughs> I actually during a presentation I had my dad texted me and said, how did the presentation go? <laughs> it's like, you're in it. So I'm just gonna take a picture, make it last longer. And um, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna move this down a little bit. I'm just gonna do some quick editing so I like to just go in here and this is just the, the Apple phone editing software and I'm just going to make that page as white as possible. So yeah, that's pretty good. And then let's see.
So I'm going to go in. So I'm in Sketchbook Pro, and I'm going to say new from image, import this photo. And so here it is. And come on. Import photo. Here it is. Create. There we go. So now the canvas size is the same size as the photo that I just took. And so I'm just going to go in here. I'm going to create a new layer. I'm going to go to this panel and hit multiply. And um, if, you're, if you happen to not be familiar with the multiply tool, all it does is it retains the quality of the line work underneath while acting almost as a transparency um, so that you, know, you can Fill this in. James, have, have you used the stylus before? And if you have, why did you just go to the, the images every single time? Yeah, so I, I sometimes sketch on my iPad with, um, with the pencil. And again, it's just, uh, uh oh, that's my computer. Uh, again, it's just like a matter of convenience for me. Um, and, and so. I always have my phone, I always have my notebook, I don't always have my pencil. And I also just found that when it came to this, I didn't really need the accuracy of the stylus because I wasn't doing line work. It was mostly you know, just, fi just filling. Um, and so, yeah, it's, um, it's honestly, it's, it's a very clever laziness, I guess. Yeah, so this is, yeah, definitely for ideation and even maybe some form development. Um, but yeah, I would say that this is, this is something that I feel like you can share with your team. Um, and so when you're coming up with your sort of big ideas, you could share, you could share this kind of work. And so now that I've filled it in, I'm going to, there's this button here that looks like it's going to lock the layer but in but what it actually does is it locks the pixels of the layer so when i go into it um it's not going to go outside of this area which is really helpful when you're doing this kind of this kind of filling in this in. Undo is also a really helpful feature. And then, you know, I, I like, when it comes to this kind of stuff, I like this very graphic approach. I'm not trying to get really fancy with, with airbrushes or anything. Um, I'm just trying to communicate. You know, this is this is a style that's really all about at its base level communication. And now uh, I'm going to go in and start adding my shadows. So go to multiply. Then I'm going to lower the opacity. Select my black and go in. And the thing that really unlocked it all for me was um, after getting the iPad and sketching on the iPad and learning that I could zoom and rotate, I mean, that, that makes all the difference because then you can start to emulate some of those techniques from industrial design sketching where, you know, you are, it's, it's always, for whatever reason, it's always easiest to draw a line away from yourself. Um, and so, being able to do that while spinning around your page. And again, it's sort of this like really fluid process. Um, I'm gonna go in and just add in something for the lens. And then for the highlights, I have to go in and um, just lower the opacity because if I hit multiply, it's just going to, it's going to do nothing. Like nothing will show up, for instance, like that. 
So you don't, now you don't see the highlight, now you do. in here, get some other shadows in. And then if you really want to up the ante, that's when you add in the sort of subtle highlights between the materials, the highlights and shadows. So I go into this fountain pen. The, the funniest thing to me about the iPad versus the iPhone is that they created the Apple Pencil because the iPad is not pressure sensitive, but the iPhone is pressure sensitive. So actually I can get different line weights on the iPhone by pressing harder or softer. And so if my light is coming from this direction, there's gonna be a shadow over here, and a shadow over here. Maybe I'll just... Uh, I think mostly to myself, but I could, I could also see having a conversation with my team about this um, in a pinup. Um, but yeah, I think it's majority with myself. I have a question. Uh-huh. Uh, what are the biggest pros and cons of freelancing? Ooh. Um, the biggest, let's see. The biggest pro, gosh, that's a really great question. And I should have an answer for this by now. Um, okay, cons are stability. Uh, cons are that you hand over what you've been working on and you just, you just pray that the client gets it right. You, you know, and so you're not able to see things through necessarily to the finished final product. The pro is obviously, you know, there's a variety of work. It's really interesting. You're going into new companies. You're seeing how they operate. You're meeting new people, new types of people. I mean, between the different types of companies that I work for, there's like no two office spaces are alike and no two, you know, groups of employees are alike. And so that's, that's really interesting to me. Um, and just to see how design is done in those offices is really interesting. And um, another pro is that if you feel like you, you, your work is done and you wanna walk away, just walk away. I mean, you have as much power to terminate the employment as the boss um, or as the company, and that is actually like pretty liberating. It's also a great way to test out a company. If you think you might be interested, I mean, I haven't necessarily worked for a company yet that I'm like, I wanna work with you guys full time, although uh, that might change. I, the company that I'm working for now is pretty interesting and I, and I like what they're doing, but they're also treating me like an in-house designer in that I am going through all the stages of the process into production phases which is kind of unusual for a freelancer. Um, but yeah, I think, I, think those, I think those are mostly the, the pros and cons of, of that kind of life. I'm sure, there's, I'm sure there's more, I just can't think of any off the top of my head. Yeah, I actually, um, so I started using this modeler called Onshape. I was gonna ask that question. Yeah. And, it, what's that? Because you can use your phone to do Yeah, so that's, that's the experiment that I have yet to embark on, is modeling, 3D modeling on my phone. Um, I would like to get into that a little bit more, but right now I just prefer to use a desktop. But it is nice that I could take these sketches directly from my phone and just put them into the background of Onshape to use, to use the line work. Cause that's the thing is like, 
That was one of the things that I learned at Lifetime Brands was actually sketching out the lines that you wanted. Because sometimes when you go in and you try to refine the line in SolidWorks by just kind of like looking at your sketch out of the corner of your eye, you're not going to capture the same gesture. So getting that, you know, that side view and being able to go in with the line work and try to match it as best you can, I think is really powerful. Um, and so, yeah, that's definitely something that I, that I want to start working on. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think here I'm, I'm like pretty happy with this. So this is, this is the flashlight. Um, and you know what I can do from here. Whoop. Oh yeah. These are also great things to know about sketching on your phone is you press this little dot down here and with this, with this little double puck here, you can um, increase or decrease the size of your brush, which is really helpful when you're going through and, um, you know, filling in or erasing. And then again, you know, with your brush and then down here, you can select your colors. I just try to stick with this color palette. You can also, there's all these Copic colors in here, um, which is great. And you can also, if you wanted to use the same, if you wanted to use this color and just get different gradations of it, you can pull this up and down and do that, which is really cool. Um, I think the last thing that I'm going to do here is put a shadow under this. The, the only issue with multiply is that if I'm going in here with the shadow and I'm going to go back to my paintbrush tool. So the two, the two tools I use are just this paintbrush and this fountain pen. And so I'm just going to go through. That's a little too much. And put the shadow in. I don't, I don't get too fancy with shadows at this point. I could map out where the shadow is going to fall. But I just pretty much end up doing a pretty direct drop shadow. Um, and maybe next time I wouldn't put these scribbles in. <laughs> That's the other part of this is, you know, I'm, I'm experimenting with this process. And so it's, it's constantly experimenting and refining and figuring out what works and what doesn't. So I'll just go in and sometimes you can overwork a sketch and that doesn't lead to a good result in here. So then if I wanted to, I can go in, save the sketch. I can go down to this menu here, share, save image, go to the old gram and, uh, oh, hey, Christy Brinkley. And, uh, and just, you know, filter it to my, to my heart's desire. <clears throat> so that's that process. I just want to give you guys a glimpse because actually on all the posters in the hallway is this style that I've been working on recently. And I know that I said that I avoided my, my iPad because of the bulkiness, but recently, actually when I was out at BYU, I was watching as a student took notes in the notes application on her iPad with her pencil. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's, that's kind of cool. There's my intro. Uh, and so I've started actually sketching in my notes and using the continuous line method as well as the few tools. I mean, this is what I love about this program. These are your tools. That's it. I mean, the more that you can sort of remove at this stage in the game so that you're not raising the levels of complexity in terms of you know, this is about ideas at this stage. You want to focus on the ideas, not the tools. And so, yeah. I, and the other thing that I love about this program so far is this endless scroll. I mean, this is just, this is me on the airplane going through all these concepts. And I'm able to just once I'm finished with one idea, move along, move along to the next. And I have this complete 
scroll of a record of where I've been and where I've ended up and, and, the, and the key ideas along the way. So that's just a brief glimpse into my, my new experiment. So anyway, um, how are we doing on time? <laughs> yeah. When does this end? Okay. All right. Great. Well, there you go. <laughs>thing is recently like with my most recent client what I actually end up showing a lot more is really rough CAD renderings which you know people can be kind of wary about because it makes it look like you're a little bit further along than you are but this is a client where I'm in-house like they you know they know where I'm at in the process I'm presenting to my team my like this is a hardware team and so um, that, doesn't, that doesn't scare them. That doesn't make them think that I'm further along, that I've figured more things out. But it, sometimes, sometimes sketching can, can confuse clients. And, and one of the things that can happen is they focus in on the detail, like a detail in your sketch rather than a detail of the design. And like they can't get over that detail. And so... Um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where you just kind of have to feel out the client and see what, what they're accustomed to and, and what you can show them. And, you know, I could, that's the thing is like some clients, yeah, I would take this and I would do a more polished sketch maybe. Um, but I would also show all of this work probably in the background and just, just to be like, look, I, I didn't waste your time. I was, I was working on this, I was deliberating, and, and this is what kind of came out of all of that. So, yeah. Yeah? For the sake of doing things kind of on the fly and doing kind of experimentation of thought and process, I mean, you say that you show some of these things in the background. I almost wonder how does it affect the people that I'm wondering. Mm. Just for, like, the front preliminary application. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think it also depends on, like, the time period between that, that first meeting and, and the meeting, you know, the second meeting. So, if the second meeting is pretty close, then I think that this kind of, this kind of uh, illustration, this kind of sketching is, is what is probably expected, you know. You're just, uh, just kind of finding your footing you know, and, and fleshing out this thing. Um, but the problem that I often find with this stage is that it's really hard. It, this is all in my experience, and, and maybe I'm doing it wrong. But uh, I, I find that clients have a hard time making the decision, and maybe you're supposed to make the decision, lead them towards the decision. But if you just show them stuff like this, it's really hard for them to do that. And, and maybe it's just a matter of, hey, you know, here are these sketches. Sit down with them for a night or two and then get back to me. Because, like, trying to, trying to get your client to make a decision during a meeting can sometimes turn them off and sometimes, you know, make them uh, hesitant to, to make any sort of definitive decision. Um, and that's where I also think that models like making models and making little either cardboard models to further reinforce like even if that model is kind of crude to further reinforce these kind of crude sketches like that can be pretty effective um but yeah i don't know if i answered your question no you did and i can i can see where you're coming from because in, so i'm actually not small graph okay Yeah. Uh, to get across the fact that like this is a physical thing that we're making, it's not just something that's on paper. 
Right, right. So it kind of takes away a lot of that ambiguity. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. You're my, you're my freshman drawing instructor. And you're gonna you're gonna give me a tools list of why before I come in on day one. What are those tools? Oh man. Uh, drawing class. Yeah. Because it's the it's the thing is like are we changing to a digital world? Right. Well that that was the interesting thing that I found about seeing that BYU student write in her notes, you know, she was, she was writing in notes on her iPad with an Apple Pencil rather than using notebook or typing into her notes. So that was, that was interesting to me that, like, she wouldn't, she wouldn't just fully adopt one technology or another. It was kind of this hybrid, in, in my view. And so, I mean, that's one case. But I do, I do find you know, the younger generations are, are much more comfortable using their phones for all sorts of things. And, you know, I think that maybe this can bridge, bridge that gap a little bit, you know, kind of say, kind of extend that hand to say like, here, like I, I sort of understand, I understand the technology that you're dealing with on a, on a daily basis and, and here's how I utilize it in a way that's sort of unexpected maybe to them, and maybe that gets them excited. But I do find, I think that starting out with that tactile feel of sketching, and even sometimes sketching with markers, is just like, there's a, there's a level of satisfaction to that that I don't know that this is at yet. But, um, you know, this is, this is kind of its own, its own thing. So I don't know, I don't know how to quite answer that. But, uh, but I think starting with pen and paper is, uh, to me, it's the way to go. Yeah. James, you've done some work with companies like MakerBot. What's your process for taking these kind of initial ideas and communicating with yourself, sketches, and bringing it into a potential 3D printing situation? Or mm. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, um, so that project that I did with Reed, I mean, the whole thing with that and, and how I like to use 3D printing is to move through things very quickly. Like, I, I like to move through, I don't know, I, I'll bring up a project that I'm, you know, pretty proud of. I, this was for the MakerBot, uh, a MakerBot design competition. And this whole process, so what I did was I, <laughs> I took Allen wrenches because I was trying to figure out what to do with all these Allen wrenches from all the furniture that I've constructed in my apartment. And then also wanted to add a fidget to my Muji pens. Um, and so like adding this spinning feature and then putting that all together into sort of this, this hanging pen organizer. But this is what that process looked like. And it was literally like doodles to CAD to print and then like that whole cycle starting again. Like it was, honestly, it was one of my favorite projects that I've ever done just, just in that process of like, you know, I get to sketch something out, I get to CAD it out, I get to print it out. And, and with the size of these, these prints took like 30 minutes. And so I was able to quickly verify something, jump back into CAD, also put another print on. Like this was, this was 48 hours, like <laughs> this is kind of, well, so in true industrial designer fashion, I started the project like three days before it was due. And um, basically, and because of my New York City apartment, <laughs> my printer was in my bedroom uh, with my wife and me. And so I was printing around the clock, sketching, doing CAD around the clock. But again, it was like, there was never, there was never a moment where I was 
really pausing. It was constantly moving and, and making. And so, um, yeah, that, that's kind of how that project came together. And then similarly with, um, with the project with Reed, uh, we were getting together once a week to do these brainstorms with the form families. And once we had decided on, on, an, on an idea that night, we would often do the CAD maybe the next day, two days later, print it out, come back the next week and talk about what we had done. And, and so it was very quick through the process and quickly learning like what worked and what didn't and was this usable. And, you know, I think we came up with some really interesting ideas that, you know, I, I really enjoyed this project a lot. I can't, I can't express enough how much I think it's valuable to, to do this kind of brainstorming, even if it's with yourself. Like, you know, I do these live streams where I'm doing brainstorms and I'm talking about things. For me, I often find that talking about things while I'm doing them can sort of illuminate like what is interesting about this? What is silly about this? What doesn't work about this? Does it resonate? And, you know, going back and forth with Reed while we were iterating on things, we were able to feed off of each other. And it was, you know, really active uh, iteration session. Um, and then we were both able to come out with these pretty unique watering cans that, you know, in a relatively short amount of time. I mean, it's a, it was an hour. It was an hour brainstorm to come up with an idea to execute it. And so, you know, we, we came up with, with these guys to represent the form families that we had done. And, you know, these probably need more refinement, a bit more refinement from where they are, but for maybe a total of, you know, eight hours of work and then, I mean, like, you know, eight hours of documenting probably, because uh, presentations are no walk in the park, but this was, you know, eight hours of work essentially um, to come up with some pretty radically different ideas. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't get the last part of the question. Hmm. Um, between like Instagram or Twitter or any of those kind of platforms. Um, so the interesting thing is, is that Instagram was not a, was not in existence when I was in school, and I don't. I I have I have a hard time reconciling like how I feel about students using Instagram. Because on one hand, I feel like it's a really useful tool in terms of rounding out like who you are as a person and what you're interested in. Um, but the other thing that happens is that, you know, it com becomes about the, the slot machine, the likes and, and these things. And they can kind of, it can kind of drive you crazy. I mean, I have, taken many Instagram hiatuses because I'm like, I can't deal with this right now. I need to focus on other things, on real things. But the thing that I have loved about Instagram is that ability to round out my character in a way that my portfolio doesn't necessarily do all on its own. Because one of the things that you find out about, about jobs and interviewing is oftentimes it's it, like, it is about the work in your portfolio, but oftentimes it is who you are as an individual and whether people can, can feel like, like that was, that's a person that I want to work with. Um, you know, when I, when I uh, first saw Nick, Nick Baker's work on Instagram, I was like, I think I would really enjoy hanging out with this kid and I think he's very talented. I think I would enjoy working with him. And so now he's in New York we hang out together, we work together, you know, it's, it is, it is revealing of a person 
Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think it's probably obviously we're in this very image based field. So I feel like Instagram does make kind of the most sense as a platform for us. But as you can see, you know, if you're on Instagram right now and you're seeing what's happening in the industrial design community, there's a lot of conversation about like, what should we be showing? What should we be showing students? Like what kind of work should we show to show what the industrial design career is really like? Because a lot of, a lot of us, uh, who are professionals are using it and uh, Instagram as a place to experiment as a place to like blow off steam after work and and do things that we can't do at our jobs but is that is that misleading the, the kid you know the students as to what we actually do in our day-to-day -day jobs and you know I for me Instagram is a place to experiment and I think I will always treat it that way because I think uh, that's the side of me that I want to explore on Instagram and I want to explore industrial design. I mean, the field itself is a hundred years old and, or maybe uh, it was at least coined a hundred years ago. And so it's this field that has emerged in the blink of an evolutionary eye. And so why not explore the boundaries of what this career is? Um, and so, yeah, I, uh, I think Instagram probably makes the most sense for industrial designers, but I would also proceed with caution if you're a student because there's, there's already so much that you're dealing with in your daily lives and in your studio life that, I mean, for me, when I'm taking breaks from Instagram, it's because I'm a little burnt out because I feel like I have two jobs. So if that answers your question, you have a... Oh, you mean like steal the idea? Yeah. So um, I wish Nick were here because he has a really strong opinion about this. He thinks that you should upload your work no matter what. Because as an industrial designer, your job is going to be to come up with ideas for the rest of your career. Like that's, that's the nature of the job. And so you need to be okay if if this idea gets taken, I mean, he actually did get an idea taken. Um, it was produced in China, or at least as far as you can tell. But he posted about that on the Core 77 forums back in the day, and then that got picked up by Fast Company, and so an article got written about him, and, and so all these things happened after that. I also think that I've seen a lot of instances on Instagram where graphic designers are calling out major companies for stealing their work and you know the social media the Instagram community descends upon that company and and you know maybe <laughs> who knows if if a major corporation stole your idea then maybe you could claim authorship and you know maybe maybe come out of it with some royalties I have no idea yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think um, Nick's opinion is, you know, post it. I, I feel like, you know, for my stuff, I'm not really that concerned because I'm not, I think the things that I'm posting are often not that monetizable. Like, you know, I, I'm posting things that, you know, like my, my helicopter ideas, which you know, I would love it if somebody made this, uh, but uh, you know, and this is this is just something I'm doing out of pure pure interest, and you know, these like wacky chair ideas, and you know, if somebody produced that, then I would be like, oh my gosh, people actually think that's interesting, um, and so yeah, I think uh, I don't know that it's necessary to keep your ideas so close to the chest unless you have something that's like you could go out and get a utility patent for, you know, that's when you're like, okay, maybe I shouldn't post this, but otherwise I think it's okay.
right. like weight on your shoulders. Um, but do you think like that community that you can reach out to and connect with through Instagram can be worth that? That's the question. I feel like that's the million dollar question because I think that Instagram can also be a place to make inroads with professionals that you admire. You know, it's, it's a great way to break the ice. I mean, people come to New York City for a trip and they message me on Instagram and they're like, hey, do you, you wanna come out? Like, I'll buy you a drink. And I'm like, yeah, sure. Like, that sounds great. And, you know, usually it's, it's a great conversation with, with somebody who's, who's a designer and I love talking to designers. And, and so I think, you know, Back in the day when we were trying to make connections with professionals, it was all about IDSA conferences and walking up awkwardly to a professional and trying to figure out the right thing to say that's not going to make them totally want to blow you off and, you know, like that they can smell that you want a job, you know. <laughs> and uh, I, think, I think you can start those relationships even before you're looking for a job through a thing like Instagram just to say, hey, like, I really like your work and you know, what have you. Yeah, so it's, it's still to be decided, to be determined. Yes? So, um, your Instagram, I saw one of your, I guess, it was like a big industrial design sketch page. Yeah. And in the stories, they were like, they posted a quote by Victor Kaepernick. Yeah. Which was, um, there are professions that are more harmful than industrial design, but only a few of them. And that really, like, we do end up making lots of goods and not all of them are going to be used to the fullest extent and they're going to be thrown away and all. Right. So I was just wondering what are your thoughts on our role in this um, time of just like group sustainability? Yeah. The word unnecessary and how do we get to determine what is necessary? Right. What is I feel like I could give a whole other talk about this. But one of the things is, is I feel like as designers, we are the most critical of ourselves. Like, I think that that quote comes from a self, I think, I, I, I don't know his background, if he is an industrial designer, yeah. So I, I think that, you know, we, yeah, absolutely. Like we have a right to be sort of critical about what we're doing, what we're making, but let me think. I guess the way that I feel about it is I saw this interview a long time ago with the, the band The Black Keys, and they were talking about how they were at first very adverse to licensing their music. So license, you know, licensing the music is, is saying like, you can, use it, you can use my song for a commercial or you can use my song for a television show. And they were like, we need to be authentic. We can't sell out. We can't do this. But, you know, it started to take a toll on them because they weren't making any money. Like, there's no money in record sales. There's no, there's no money in the traditional sense that there once was in the record industry. And so the way that they recontextualized the whole thing to themselves was, if not our song, then what is going in its place? And so if you're going to be exposed to music, we would rather you be exposed to our music than somebody else that we think is not making good music. And so I think I try to apply that to my mindset about industrial design and industrial designers. Like, if you're not doing that design work, then somebody else is, and they don't have the same conscience that you do. They don't have the same values that you do necessarily. And so you can bring that, those kind of values into your first job, into your, into your career. You know, just because you're going to work somewhere that you feel, I mean, my first job was designing kitchen tools and gadgets for these companies that were doing very low price point stuff. And it was hard to grapple with some days. One of, one of, my, first, one of my first projects was you know Guy Fieri? I was doing chip clips for Guy Fieri that looked like this. 
And I was like, oh my God, like I'm ruining the world. <laughs> uh, and you know, I tried, the, the thing is, is that I tried to do as much as I could to make it a quality thing. Like if it's not gonna be the most attractive thing, if I'm gonna be forced to make this thing, because at that level, like you just kind of have to, unfortunately you kind of have to do what you're told because you need to make a living you need to get money, you need to live, you know, that's, that's the unfortunate reality. I think students especially, from what I've seen, put a lot of weight on their shoulders. They're putting the weight of the world on their shoulders. And I think that, and they're like looking for that meaningful job. Sometimes you just have to take a job because otherwise you're not gonna survive and you're not gonna do the thing that you wanna do. But with that job, you can learn these skills, the skills of production, the skills to make something quality, the skills, you know, skills that are going to benefit you to when that moment comes where you're able to do that meaningful work, you have, you have the fully rounded skill set to be able to provide to that team, to be able to say like, I can design for your team because I, I have, look at my resume or like look at my work. I can produce things. And so my, my thing is to advocate for students is if you can't get the job that you want right out of college, get the job you can get, learn the skills so that then you can be ready when that moment comes to do the really good work, but bring those values into that job regardless because if you don't, somebody else is gonna screw it up. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that in my first year out of college, I just like was astounded at how much I learned because I mean it was the first time that I was making CAD for things that were actually getting made and so considerations were coming into play that had never come into play in my work before you know like wall thicknesses and like the true construction of something that would be produced and also I I was still learning a lot about form and form development and how to make an object, you know, proportional and, you know, appealing. And, um, you know, I think, um, yeah, I, I just, I, I feel like that first year was, was so critical to like where I am now in terms of the skills, in terms of the things that I value. Because even though I was at Lifetime Brands and didn't feel gr necessarily great about the work I was doing in my first year, um, although I will say that at Lifetime Brands, because of my skill set, because I was able to quickly sketch and communicate, they were putting me on projects that were much, much richer in development than other people that were not were kind of lacking in those skills so i really i really have to emphasize how much it you know sketching is still really a really big deal you know it obviously it depends on where you're trying to go and what you're trying to do but in my experience it was a big deal and um but i was able to refine those sketching skills become quicker at sketching, become more communicative in the ways that I needed to be um, in order to have real conversations about my work with real professionals. And I mean, the other skill that you get is, you know, you're, I don't know that it's necessarily a skill, but you know, you're, you're starting, so obviously school is, you know, Reed, um, Reed Schlegel, we had him on the podcast. He was talking about this idea that, you know, when you're a student, that's like your first um, network. And so when you're starting to work at your first job, you're creating your second network and that network has been the foundation of my entire career. 
you know, my manager from Lifetime Brands ended up going to be the head of ID at Peloton, bringing me in as a freelancer. And, you know, I made connections while I was there that have led to other jobs and careers. That's, that's the other, you know, big truth about industrial design is like networking with other designers is a big deal. You know, you want to be liked, you want to be the person that people think like, oh, we can depend on them to do this work and to do it well. And uh, I don't know, I'm, I feel like I'm going off on a tangent, but um, yeah, I guess just in terms of like m my, my growth and development as a designer, I think that first year out of school was, was huge. And, uh, but I keep learning things. Like that's the thing is I, when I left school, I was so, my senior year, I had like uh, a, a mid midlife crisis where I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know anything about design. Like, why would anybody trust me? Why would anybody hire me? And the thing that you learn in your first job is <laughs> nobody's expecting you to be able to design like all the way through. Like they're expecting you to be able to do those initial stages pretty well. But beyond that, they are, they're investing in you. They're investing in your career. They're investing in your continued education. And that was really a relieving thing to find out um, when I left school. So James, we have about room for about maybe one or two more questions. Sure. Yeah. Um, if you were to go back to school, what are like some things that you'd want to do more of while you have the time? Yeah. In school? Oh man, there's yeah. That's another one that that like I feel like I could write a whole book about because I because I think that. I think it's very easy to like look back and say, oh man, like I did everything wrong. But I've also, I've also landed okay. Like I, I, so it's this thing where it's like, yes, there are things that I definitely could have done better in school, but I've also gotten to where I've gotten to because of the way that I treated school. But I think that one of the things that I really wish that I had done more of was just really getting like, more into model making and more into like rough models while I was in school and just like I don't even know if I had a hot glue gun like that would be the first thing that I would tell a student to go out and buy is a hot glue gun it's like if you can put together a really crappy model like it can speak volumes more than a sketch sometimes and it's it's kind of astounding and so I think a lot of times I put maybe too much emphasis on sketching and I would just get stuck in just sketch land all day and just would never break out of it. And I wish that I had pushed myself to just, and like occasionally I would. I mean, you find these moments throughout your life where you're like, oh man, I, I really like pushed myself out of my comfort zone that time and look what happened. But then you forget that the next time around. I wish that I had always addressed things in that way. I wish that I had kind of sketched through things quickly, maybe one day and then immediately moved into really crude, rough model making. And the other thing is with my portfolio, I was always tweaking my portfolio and never getting it out on time. And so that was another thing where I felt like I needed to be, I, I have a manager that says don't, I think it's don't let um, perfect be the enemy of good or something. But basically it's, you know, you can, you can try and try to, to get that perfect portfolio together, but the portfolio that's going, to, that's going to win out is the one that's in front of the person that you're trying to get it to at the right time. So, yeah, I, I think those are probably my two, my two biggest lessons from school. One more question? All right. All right, so... <laughs> oh yeah so i'm i'm at i draw on receipts on instagram uh you can also check out the minor details podcast if you don't already that's me and my co-host nick baker um talking about industrial design we've we have guests on we also just dive into different topics and then um is that it yeah i guess that's it <laughs>